We turn this morning to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. I want to take up again our study on uh, the name of God. Uh, for those of you who have not been present uh, through those studies, we have begun looking at the name of Jehovah, uh, this name that the Lord gives to himself that belongs to him alone. It's incommunicable in that it, uh, it has no analogy uh, among men. Other men in Scripture are referred to in terms similar to God. Other gods in Scripture are referred to by the same titles as God. But this one belongs to the Lord himself alone. We've noted how this name Jehovah is found throughout Scripture in various compound forms. And as God gives himself those names, he's re revealing to us progressively more and more of who he is. And so we've considered Jehovah Jireh. He revealed himself in this way to Abraham at Mount Moriah when he provided uh, for him a lamb as a substitute sacrifice in the place of Isaac. And then we considered Jehovah Rapha or Jehovah Rophaika, I am the Lord that healeth thee, when the Lord taught his people in affliction at the bitter waters of Marah. Again, the Lord appended a name to that event that we might know him. Then Jehovah Nissi, when Amalek attacked Israel, and the Lord delivered them when Moses prayed and Joshua fought. Uh, the Lord granted them the victory. Jehovah Nissi, in that the Lord would have perpetual warfare with Amalek. Maybe you remember, children, that that means the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my battle standard. And in his name, we go forth to fight. Well, in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, again, the Lord is speaking to Israel, his church as a corporate body, and he gives himself the name Jehovah Makadishkem. Jehovah Makadishkem. Verse 13, Exodus 30, 31. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So you have Jehovah there in the capitalized form of the word Lord. And then you have Makadishkem, one word in Hebrew, but translated, that doth sanctify you. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Well, the context for this verse is found at the end of directives given by God through Moses concerning the ceremonial ordering of worship in the tabernacle. From chapter 25 and forward, God gives the pattern by which his old covenant people must worship. He begins in the holy place and he works out. From the Ark of the Covenant to the altar of burnt sacrifice. God is there. How will we approach him? Well, ultimately it is through sacrifice offered by a priest and the sprinkling of blood upon the mercy seat in the holy place where God dwells. So having given those stipulations at the beginning of chapter 31, men are set apart to make all of the furniture of the tabernacle. Bezalel, the son of Aholiab and his uh, uh, companion, likewise Aho uh, Pardon me. Bezalel and Aholiab are set apart to uh, make the furniture. So the furniture is to be made. Moses is up the mountain. Chapter 32 introduces the whole problem of the molten calf. And then later in the book, all of the things are made. But right at the end of that section, verse 12 to the end of chapter 31, the Lord gives certain details concerning the Sabbath. Very interesting. Details concerning the Sabbath. 
Now we know it's the weekly Sabbath that he's speaking about because in verse 17 he refers to creation. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. But in verse 13, our text, God tells his people that the Sabbath is a sign of his covenant. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. It's a sign. It's linked to this covenant language. Me and you, I am your God, you are my people. As he continues, he commands Israel to keep the Sabbath day upon the pain of death. And then we come to verse 16. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations. And this idea of the covenant is brought in again for a perpetual covenant. Verse 17. The idea of a sign is reiterated. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And then creation is referred to. So it's in this context, the ceremonies haven't been given, the Sabbath being focused upon as central to the religion of Israel, that God reveals himself as Jehovah Makadishkem, the Lord that sanctifieth thee. Well, if you turn to Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 8, you'll see the Lord calls himself by this name again. Leviticus 20, verse 7 and verse 8, Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctifieth you. And again in the next chapter, Leviticus chapter uh, 21 uh, and verse 8, Thou shalt sanctify him therefore, for he offereth the bread of thy God. He shall be holy unto thee, for I, the Lord, which sanctify you, am holy. So you've got it in Exodus, twice in Leviticus. And then if you turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. And note there verse 8. When the Lord is talking about uniting his people, Israel and Judah, once again. Sorry, verse 28, Ezekiel 37 and verse 28. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. When my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Jehovah Makadish Kem. Well, that's a big word. Uh, some of our children were laughing this morning when we were talking about this over family worship. Dad, how are you going to say that word when you're preaching? Well, the answer to that is I've been practicing a little bit, but we might revert to the easier form of the Lord that sanctifies you at various points. But this title, Jehovah Makadish Kem, comes from the Hebrew verb kadash, which means to sanctify or to make holy. It's linked to the Hebrew noun, kodesh, which means sanctified, set apart, consecrated, or holy. And when you think about that verb, and all that it teaches us, you can really separate it into two key ideas. The first is, it teaches us that we are set apart by God. We are set apart by God. In other words, God makes a difference. He distinguishes one thing from another. He makes it holy. So you have holy vessels that the Lord uses in tabernacle service. They aren't really any different than other vessels apart from the fact that God has chosen these vessels and he's not chosen other vessels for that use. So the first idea here is to be set apart by God. And the second idea is linked to that. It means that we are set apart to God. So God distinguishes for a purpose. He chooses these things and makes them distinct 
for a holy use in order that he might employ them in a particular way for his own glory. And so think about the vessels in the sanctuary again. God distinguishes and chooses, but he does so that they might be used and employed in the service of the sanctuary. Well, in the same way the Lord chooses people in the world, he, is, he sets them apart and he also sets them apart to himself. Now, what we're considering this morning is that the Lord who is Jehovah Makadishkem, the Lord who sanctifies you, is the one who does this in both senses. We are set apart by God and we are set apart to God in that he constitutes us and makes us his holy people in the world. So what a wonderful title to think upon this morning. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Jehovah Makadish Kem. Well, I want to open this up uh, with the Lord's help this morning under four main heads. First of all, the Lord who sanctifies you sanctifies his people eternally. And then we'll say the same thing, but the Lord who sanctifies us, sanctifies us definitively. And then thirdly, progressively. And fourthly, he does it specifically. We'll consider then, first of all, the first thing. Jehovah Makarishkem sanctifies his people eternity, eternally. I mean by that, that he sets us apart by free grace from all other people in his eternal covenant of redemption. Another way we might state it is this. We're talking about divine sovereign election. And brethren, the wonder of your salvation, which is so great, so great when we get to the cross and gaze upon our Lord Jesus Christ, the wonder of that salvation begins here. Remember how Paul launches on that great doxology at the beginning of the book of Ephesians? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. What's the first? According as he hath chosen us in him from the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. All of that relates to our text this morning. It is the Lord who is Jehovah Makadish Kem who is making that choice. And the Bible speaks about it in many different ways. It uses the term elect. It uses the verb to choose. It speaks about predestination. But it also speaks about divine election by the idea of sanctification. If you turn to the book of Jude and look there at verse 1, note how Jude introduces his letter. Jude and verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now, you might immediately read that the way that we normally think of sanctification. The work of God in our hearts making us holy. But is it not significant that he says we're sanctified by God the Father and he places it even before our calling in time in the world? It's the idea of the Father having set a people apart. Or turn to 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll read verse 1 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and Paul's introduction to the church in Corinth. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, and listen to what he puts first. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, yes, there can be a sense here in which Paul is talking about our union with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll come to that later, that we are set apart in Christ in the world. 
But brethren, that has an eternal origin in that we are set apart by God in the covenant of redemption where he takes a, a, an elect number of sinners and he gives them as a gift to his son. What a gift. An elect number of unworthy sinners, he gives them to his son, and his son will come in time to give himself for them. Well, you see, the idea here is to be set apart to be God's in covenant. And that helps us understand the context. In Exodus chapter 31, I'm your God, you're my people. This idea of the Sabbath is right at the heart of this relationship. And in it I am the Lord which sanctifieth you. Well, isn't this language used repeatedly of Israel in the Old Testament? That they were gods by God's own sovereign choice. If you turn now to 1 Peter and look there with me at chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Peter draws from one of those Old Testament statements concerning Israel in Exodus chapter 19, and he simply applies it to the church. What I want you to see here is all the terms that he uses are linked to this idea of our sanctification by God in Christ before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy." Four statements about you as God's people. The first is this. You are a chosen generation. God has distinctly made choice of you and not another. So he says to his church today, like to Israel in the Old Testament, you only have I known from among all the nations of the earth. I've chosen you. Not because there was any good in you or not because you were distinct in yourself from others and therefore you merited my choice. But I chose you freely, sovereignly, and for my own glory. Not only are you a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood. What has that got to do with our sovereign election? We'll read the Old Testament and priests were not uh, priests did not choose themselves. As you read through the stipulations of Exodus, God says, I have chosen Aaron. I have sanctified them to be my priest. I have sanctified, I have set apart the sons of Levi. And so you get the idea again here. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood sanctified by God unto spiritual service. And then thirdly, we have our, our word. You are a holy nation. You are a sanctified nation. You are, you are a people set apart by God to God in the world, called to be holy. And then that fourth statement, you are a peculiar people. He doesn't mean you're weird, though the world might think you are. The idea of a peculiar people here goes back to Exodus chapter 19 where Israel calls, or God calls Israel, my segula, my peculiar treasure. So you can imagine a woman having maybe a box full of rings and she has the one that is most precious to her. It's her peculiar treasure. God says, Israel is my peculiar treasure. In the New Testament, it takes the force of a purchased and acquired precious possession. Do you see what we're saying? Jehovah Makadish Kem 
sanctifies his people eternally. And when you hear that name this morning as a Christian, it takes you back. Indeed, it takes you right back to when Jehovah sets apart a people eternally unto salvation. That's a joy for me to declare to you today. But it is utterly impossible for me to give you a reason for it. Why does God choose one and not another? Why has the covenant Lord put his name upon you and not another? Why does he say, I am the Lord who has set you apart and not another? Well, as I said, not for anything that is within you. Calvinists ought never to be proud because they know and believe the doctrine of God's election. They ought to be the most humble Christian upon the face of the earth because God has freely set his love upon you to make, him you, make you his own. But brethren, though you come to participate in that love in time, you ought never to forget that the wonder of your salvation takes you back here and that God has eternally purposed to make you his. There has never been a time, if we might say, there has never been a time where God's eternal purpose has not been toward you as a true believer in Jesus Christ. Jehovah Makadish Kem sanctifies his people eternally. Secondly, Jehovah Makadish Kem sanctifies his people definitively. Now we've considered the eternal aspect of our sanctification, and you know that there is much that pertains to our sanctification in time. But when you think of it, you most often think of it in terms of that process of sanctification. Like our catechism asks, what is, the, what is sanctification? Sanctification is a work of God's free grace. We are enabled more and more to live unto God, more and more to die unto sin. So it brings us into time, but yet when we come into time, we have to understand, first of all, that there is a definitive aspect to our sanctification. I mean by that, there is an act in terms of sanctification. Indeed, I'm going to show you that there are two acts that pertain to our sanctification. What is the first? Well, the first is that you are sanctified in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are sanctified in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and listen to what we read from verse 10 through 14. Hebrews 10 verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Note the word sanctified. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Do you see what the author is telling us here? He's not speaking of our sanctification as an inward change in our hearts wrought by the Holy Spirit. He's speaking of our sanctification as something that happened at the cross of Christ, where the Son of God in our flesh offered himself as one sacrifice that would satisfy divine justice forever and perfect those who were sanctified. Children, what did Jesus do at the cross? He paid the debt of the sins of his people so that that debt would be cancelled. 
But of course, he did more than that. By the shedding of his blood, he purchased that people to be his own once and for all so that we might have eternal redemption. Everything that the blood of bulls and goats only pointed to but could never do, Jesus, by offering himself one sacrifice for sin forever, sitting down at the right hand of God, what has he done? In his death, he has set us apart as his purchased people. And that fact will never change. So you hear that this morning and you respond by faith. You believe in what God has done through his Son upon the cross. Now be careful here because as the apostle continues in chapter 10, he uses the word sanctified again. And this time he applies it to visible church members. And he warns you that there is an outward setting apart unto God in the church by the blood of Jesus. But if you trample underfoot the blood that you've been sanctified with in that sense, then you will fall into the hands of the living God who says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. So you have this wonderful truth, but knowing about the cross of Christ is not the same as being sanctified in the death of Christ. You must believe upon Christ to know that you've been set apart and eternally redeemed by him. But listen, when you come to God through faith, this truth, whereby one offering he has sanctified, he has perfected those people forever, you can know today that taking Jesus Christ by faith, that is true of you. That Christ has paid the debt of your sins. And Christ has sanctified you unto the Father by purchasing you and making you a son of the living God. Jehovah Makadish Kim sanctifies you definitively in the death of Christ. But there's another aspect here that's definitive in relation to sanctification. And it's this. He sanctifies you in your union with Jesus Christ. So there at the cross... There's a sanctification. But then when it comes into our experience, when we believe in Jesus and are united to him, there's another definitive act with respect to sanctification. Turn here to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, another great chapter about sanctification and holiness in the lives of God's people. If we're justified freely by grace, does that mean we can live as we please? Paul says, under no circumstances. But free grace motivates holiness. But not only that, there's something foundational to the life of holiness. What is it? We'll see how it begins in Romans chapter 6. And particularly in verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? What's he speaking about here? Well, note the word into. Note the word baptized. There's a setting apart again, but we're being set apart into the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've been baptized into Christ you have been baptized into his death. In other words, you've died in him. Then look at verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. You're united to Christ not only in his death, but you're united to Christ also in his resurrection. So think of it like this. When you come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a union that is fixed. And that union unites you to him in his death and in his resurrection. And having stated that, Paul issues in verse 11 the first command in the book of Romans. Everything else has been teaching. But his first word of application is this. Not go and be holy... But verse 11, 
remember something. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the first word of application from the gospel in Romans chapter 6. Understand who you are. Remember what God has done in Christ and know that you're united to Christ in his death and in his resurrection. Brethren, this is how Christ is made sanctification unto you. You've died in him. You've risen from your grave in sin in him. And the power of sin has been broken definitively once and for all in your life. You are no more under the dominion of the law, but you've been set free and you're able to walk in the power of the Spirit under the grace of Christ. That's never going to change. God has done something definitively in your regeneration. He's united you to Jesus Christ. And the old government is gone. And the old nature is dead. And a new life has begun. Children, where were you born? You likely don't remember it. Where were you born? Many of you were born in a, a hospital maternity ward. Some of you might have been born at home. Some are about to be born very soon. But do you know where the Christian's born? He's not born in the spiritual maternity unit. He's born in the mortuary. He's born in the graveyard. He's born where God kills him. Puts to death the old man. And out of the grave, not out of the womb, out of the grave, he brings a new creature in Jesus Christ. The old is dead, the new is alive, and Jehovah Makadish Kem is the one who does it. I am the Lord who sanctifies you eternally, who sanctifies you definitively in the cross, who sanctifies you definitively in regeneration, making you a new creature, giving you a new identity, filling you with a new power that you never had before. And that brings us in the third place to Jehovah Makadish Kem sanctifies you progressively progressively. Back to our text, Exodus chapter 31 and verse 13. The covenant relationship is there in view, isn't it? He is our God and we are his people. But brethren, this particular name reminds you of what kind of people you are to be. The Lord who sanctifies you says, Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Look again at Leviticus chapter 20. Because there this is stated more explicitly. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. In this chapter, he's dealing with idolatry, child sacrifice to Molech. He's also focusing upon sexual immorality. But there in verse 7 and verse 8, he pulls all of his statutes together and he says, you're to walk in this way. You are to sanctify yourselves. But know this, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Do you understand how that applies to you this morning? That you as a believer have a duty to live a holy life unto God. 
but yet you must understand as you engage in that, that the strength to live that holy life is from Jehovah Makadishkem, the Lord who sanctifies you. In Paul's terms, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is the Lord who worketh in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. The Lord, Jehovah Makadishkem. That means that we receive strength from the Lord to die unto our sins. So Romans chapter 6, definitively, you've been raised from the dead. The power of sin has been broken in your life. What's the second command? What's the second word of application in the book of Romans? Well, know who you are by way of your identity and understand that you have the spirit to live the Christian life, then roll your sleeves up and get to the work of making yourself holy. It's just rephrased Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7 and verse 8. Sanctify yourselves, knowing this, that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You've died to sin, now go and die to it. You're alive to righteousness, therefore go and live unto it. But know that the responsibility to be holy does not mean that you have the independent ability to be holy. You have to go to the Lord who sanctifies you in order to be sanctified. What will that look like in your life? While you're struggling with some lust, don't try to fight it in your own strength. Get down on your knees and beg Jehovah Makadish Kem, who sanctifies you, that he would give you the strength to put that lust to death. Come to him and say, Lord, I'm in the middle of a raging battle. Teach my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Give me the perception to identify the enemy. Give me the courage to put it to death. Make me ruthless to put the knife to the throat of my sins and to execute them. Or maybe you're struggling under some sense of temptation. Lord, help me. Help me to barricade this temptation in. Help me to lay siege to it. Give me the wisdom to erect spiritual blockades so I can starve it to death. But I don't have the wisdom or the strength to do this on my own. But Lord, you, you are Jehovah Makadish Kem, the Lord who sanctifies me. Help me to sanctify myself in your strength. You receive from him strength to die unto sin. You receive to him strength to live unto God. When I said to you earlier that you were united to Jesus Christ, I trust that a smile in a sense comes upon your soul. What, what a glorious truth, united to Jesus Christ. Well, what does it mean to be united to Jesus Christ in terms of our text? It means that you are united to Christ, who is Jehovah, that sanctifies you. You are united to Christ, who is Jehovah, that sanctifies you. He who set himself apart on the cross and died for you, draws you into union with himself and says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. But me is Jehovah Makarish Ken. The absolute, independent, eternal, all-sufficient God of heaven and earth who took our flesh 
and redeems us unto himself. Will you have any lack in Christ to be able to go forth and live unto God? God gives you everything you need to be his holy people in this world. So you go to the vine and you draw all of your strength from him for fruitfulness. You go to the fountain of life and you, de- you drink deeply and your soul is refreshed and revived. You go to the bread of life and you find in him again and again all sufficient grace to strengthen and nourish your soul to live unto God. The Lord who sanctifies us, sanctifies us eternally, definitively, progressively. But then in the fourth place, Jehovah Makadish Kem sanctifies you particularly. Exodus 31 verse 13 is very particular. God reveals this name to us in the context of the Sabbath day. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that sanctifieth you. Now to pose the question, how do you know that the Lord is the Lord who sanctifies you? You could give me the whole of my sermon back and say, well, these are ways that I know that to be true. But in Exodus chapter 31, God says, this is how you will know it to be true. I've given you my Sabbath for you to keep it. I've given you my Sabbath for you to keep it. And therefore, the Sabbath day is a sign of your sanctification to God. We're living this, each one of us, right now as a congregation of God's people. Verse 13, it's a sign that you may know. Verse 16, wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Don't miss that. Brethren, the Sabbath is a perpetual covenant and a sign to God's people forever. The Sabbath that he made for man in creation when there was no sin. He now, in the covenant of grace, fills with redemptive significance and purpose. He restates it to Israel, his redeemed and covenant people. Do you see how the Sabbath is now employed by God as a sign in relation to his covenant of grace? Brethren, this is the context of, of this whole passage. This Sabbath is now rooted, full of self, uh, redemptive significance in God's covenant of grace. Well, if the covenant of grace continues from the Old Testament into the New Testament, how can the Sabbath, which is a sign and token and blessing, rooted in that covenant, how can that Sabbath cease to have a bearing upon the church of Christ? No, it's not a sacrament, but it is a sign. And a little bit like circumcision, when we move into the New Testament, The sign changes to baptism, but the whole import continues similarly with the Sabbath. The day changes from the last day of the week to the first day of the week, celebrating the new creation that Christ has accomplished. But the moral significance of the Sabbath continues. So what you read here in verse 13 applies to us today. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Brethren, the Sabbath is a sign to the world that the Lord has chosen a people and separated them unto himself and that he will and must be worshipped in the world. 
It's a sign of your setting apart by God. Now there's a moral obligation upon all men to keep the Sabbath day, but there's an even heightened obligation upon the redeemed of the Lord to keep the Sabbath day. And when you do it, you are a sign and a witness to the world. But you're also a sign and a witness to each other. Because if you're reading this text correctly, Exodus 31, verse 13, God says, it's not just so that the world might know, it's so that you might know that I am Jehovah Makadishkem, the Lord that sanctifies you. The gathering of the church of Jesus Christ on the Sabbath day is the supreme demonstration of this name, that the Lord has set apart a people in the world unto himself, and he calls them together on this day that we might know who he is. The central act of our week around everything around which everything else must take its place, never being relegated to a, a place of less importance than another day. And when you own the day like that, and when we come to worship the Lord in his day, we are making a declaration to the world, but to ourselves, that we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in Christ we are separated unto God. And we are his holy people. So much so that angels are in our midst, wondering at this truth, that the Lord who sanctifies his people makes it known in connection to the Sabbath day. It's a sign of your sanctification to God. But then finally, it's a means of your sanctification by God. It's a means of your sanctification by God. He sets us apart in his assembly on the Sabbath, and he brings us in order that he might bless us and sanctify us in that assembly. Didn't we see this when we looked at the name Jehovah Rophaika? I am the Lord that healeth thee. And we said Jesus is ultimately the fulfillment of this. He cleansed the leper. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. And when did he do so many of his wonderful miracles but on the Sabbath day? Demonstrating that he is the one who not only heals our bodies but he heals our souls. Well, likewise with this name, I am the Lord that sanctifies you. He explicitly roots it in relation to the Sabbath. On this day, Throughout history, God has brought multitudes of sinners to faith in Jesus Christ. On this day throughout history, God has brought those saved sinners into his assembly. And week after week, he sanctified them through his truth. His word is truth. And he has made this day the high day, the market day of the soul. And he has brought us to call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord and honorable. Brethren, all the truths that we've just looked at from point one to point three, the fact that the Lord who sanctifies us does so eternally in the covenant of redemption, definitively in the cross, definitively in our regeneration, progressively throughout the whole of our lives. Week after week, these great and glorious gospel truths are opened unto us and we are brought into the reality of them in our experience. More and more. The Lord who sanctifies you, sanctifies you specifically in relationship to the Sabbath day. Now listen, if that day is a sign that the Lord is the Lord who sanctifies you, what is a neglect of that day to your soul? 
What is the neglect of that day to your soul? It has to be the opposite. If you and your experience are neglecting the Sabbath day, it is a sign that the Lord is not the Lord who is sanctifying you. Well, I remind you the penalty was death in the Old Testament, and it was death because ultimately the neglect of the, of the Sabbath is a contempt of the covenant of grace and the redemption that God has purchased in His Son. Hebrews chapter 10, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the, as the manner of some, some is, it has serious import. Privately not sanctifying the Sabbath day. Just teaching, taking it as a day where you can rest because you're bored. Not giving yourself to holy exercises. Having no appetite for God's word, for prayer, for fellowship. Man, that, that's a sign of serious, serious spiritual danger. But if you love the Lord's day, and if you're sanctifying the Lord's day, it's a sign of this, that the Lord is the Lord who sanctifies you. That he's doing this work in your heart. Well, we glorify God for all the ways he makes himself known to us. And especially this morning for this name, Jehovah Makadish Kem, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Let's stand for prayer.